Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us for our pre-recorded service and being online. Whether you are watching this Sunday morning or you have found us later on in the week, we're glad you joined us today. We are continuing a brand new series we began last week entitled This World in which we're going to be looking at certain elements of the end of this world with the, the rapture and the second coming and how this world is going to end. We're also going to be incorporating applications for us today and how all of this really relates to Jesus. Last week we looked at that this world is crazy and life is short. And how will we respond to the reality that life on this planet is short? And we talked about that maybe we could engage in some of the things the world has to offer. Maybe we could eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die and get involved in illicit events and maybe even get involved in things that could lead to addiction. Or maybe we could choose a different path. And we could choose a path that since life is short, we would work extra hard to make an impact on this planet and to serve Jesus. So today, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 25. We'll also be in 1 Thessalonians 4. As we look at a period of time inside what's called the tribulation. And today we're going to look at about this world, that this world needs action. It is this famous verse here in Matthew 25 and verse 35. Often misunderstood and applied to wrong uh, times in our world. That was creepy. <clears throat> this passage of scripture is often misused and applied to the wrong periods of time, but the truths are still relevant for us today. And the verse says this in Matthew 25 and verse 35. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. If you do not know the passage of Scripture, the I there is Jesus speaking, and he's referring to himself. The human beings that are having these things done to him are not Jesus. But what Jesus is saying here is how you treated these particular people is how you treated me. So today we're going to look at this world, this crazy, mixed up, chaotic, evil at times world needs action, needs believers to get involved and act now. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 4 and Matthew 25. Join us in prayer. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, as the world gets crazy, we see more and more of a need for you. Lord, help us not to be selfish and focused on our own needs and experiences, but Lord, help us to act because the time is getting shorter and the opportunity to serve you is less and less. Lord, help us to see the least of these and act and react like a believer. In Jesus' precious name. This week I was pulling out of my neighborhood and a man came way too close to me. He kind of pulled into my lane and as he was pulling in and as he almost hit me, I hit the horn of my truck. And then I suddenly realized that this man was a senior, but not just any senior citizen. He was a man that I deeply liked and have spent a lot of time with. And suddenly I found myself going from upset that you almost hit my truck to being okay. It wasn't as bad as I thought. And I kind of waved to him. And because I knew and liked him, instead of anger and hostility, I gave him courtesy, kindness, and compassion. But what if I didn't know him? How much grace would I have given him if he was a complete stranger? You see, it's a human instinct to only help those people we know, to only give compassion to people that we love. And to only extend kindness to people that are in our family. There was a horrible story that came out of the city of Philadelphia that commuters riding on a train stood by and watched a lady be sexually assaulted by a man. 
No one stepped in and because of their inaction, they sort of encouraged this man and he did horrible things to this lady. People just sat there and they did nothing. Why? Well, she wasn't their sister. She wasn't their mom. So they did nothing. Hey, our one simple truth today, if you're taking notes, is this. In this world, treat everyone like they were Jesus. In this world, treat everyone like they were Jesus. So if Jesus cut you off when you were driving on the freeway, how would you respond? I think most of us, our reaction would be, oh, no problem, Jesus, no problem. I mean, you took a wheel, you took the wheel of that car, but uh, maybe you should have taken a driver's ed class first. But you know, there weren't a lot of minivans around in the first century of Jerusalem, so it's okay, Jesus. You know, if you treated everyone like that, what would the world be like? The new year brings statements by Christian, Christians. Every new year, they sort of post them online, and they are statements that Christians declare, but they are not in, in the Bible, and they are actually contrary to what the Word of God says. Today, I want, as we get started, I want to give you three false teachings of 2023. Three false teachings. Number one, we are told to seek God's blessings. We are told to seek God's blessings. Nowhere does the Bible say that. We are told to seek the kingdom of God. Matthew 6, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We seek the kingdom of God, and the byproduct is all these things that God would give us. In fact, it is the exact opposite. The blessed people, well, in Matthew 5, in just one verse, in verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. You see, God blesses us when we seek him and serve other people. The second false teaching of 2023 is number two. We are told to experience God, to experience God. Nowhere in the Bible are we told to experience God. To be honest, I'm not even sure what that phrase means. I have heard preachers say that repeatedly, almost like a, a throwaway line, a repetitive phrase that they say, experience God. We sort of have a tendency to treat God like a, a new Netflix show. Meaning we, we talk to our friends, hey, have you, have you seen the new season of God out? Maybe let's binge watch it together and talk about it. And then after we've experienced that, we sort of go on to something else. Modern Christianity in the Western society is all about seeking experience and emotions and not serving other people. We experience God through his grace and forgiveness. You see, that's why you need to know Christ as your personal Savior. You can do nothing to merit the forgiveness and grace of God. It is not by works. It is only by Jesus coming and dying on the cross and you accepting Christ as your personal Savior. We do not experience God. We experience God's grace and forgiveness. And after we experience that grace and forgiveness, we go out and we serve God by serving other people. And number three, the third false teaching of 2023 is we are told to be happy. You've been told this repeatedly. Oh, you deserve to be happy. You've heard people say that. I deserve to be happy. Well, happiness is all about your happenstance, all about what's happening to you right now. You don't need that. You don't need to be happy. Forget happiness. Get joy. Because joy lasts no matter what is going on. But you notice these three things about being blessed and experience and being happy. All three of these things are about you. They're about your fulfillment. They're about your experiences. They're about your happiness. You could almost in your notes over these three just write a simple word and it just says selfish. You see, the world is going to end and the world needs you to act. And it's not waiting for you to feel like it. Let me remind you of the three basic truths we looked at last week real quick. Last week we said there are three basic truths out of 2 Corinthians 4 through 4 through 5. And the first truth is number 1, the god of this world is Satan. All the insanity that we see in this world is the result of Satan and sin. But why does Satan do it? Well, the second truth is this, Satan wants the worship of this world. It's all done because Satan wants what Jesus gets and it's our worship. And how do we respond to that? Well, it's in verse 5. 
For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servant, for Christ's sake. The way we respond, number three, is the world needs the focus of preaching and praise and purpose towards Jesus. As we study our topics the next few weeks and months on the second coming and the end of this world, the thing I want you to walk away with repeatedly is not in wonder of what's going to happen in the future. I want you to constantly walk away realizing that we need Jesus. And today, Jesus is demanding that we act. He is not asking us as believers in Jesus Christ who claim to know him, who are born again, washed in the blood, who have been redeemed from the power and the presence of sin. He is demanding that we act. Today, we look at a term that is not in the Bible, a name that is not in the Bible, but one that Christians have given it. It is what we call in Christianity, the rapture. You see, the rapture is the next event that will happen in our eschatological timeline. Uh, I am what is called a pre-trib, a pre-trib, which means I believe the rapture will happen before the tribulation, that seven year period of time. There are many reasons why I believe in a pre-trib, a post-trib, meaning the rapture happens after the tribulation has become very popular these days. But I believe there's many good reasons, and I'll give you three basic ones. First, there is no mention of the church in Revelation after chapter 3. Revelation chapter 4 starts the tribulation, and well, Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3 is all about the church. And once we get into chapter 4 in the tribulation, we never see that word church again. Secondly, a post-tribulation would eliminate the immediate return of Jesus meaning the eminent return, meaning that Jesus could come back at any single moment. If Jesus could come back any moment, that means right now we could actually be in the tribulation. And if we are in the tribulation, I would simply ask, where is the temple? The temple in Jerusalem that takes place and during the tribulation, it is easy for it to be built in less than three and a half years. But if we are in the tribulation right now and Jesus can come back at any moment, where is the temple? And number three, it's the great passage of Scripture in Revelation 3.10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. In Revelation 3.10, directly that church that he's talking about there is under the church of Philadelphia, the good church. But this cannot just be for that church because nowhere did the church of Philadelphia experience a worldwide tempta a temptation. Nowhere did the Church of Philadelphia experience worldwide trials. Revelation 3.10 is setting us up for Revelation chapter 4, which is the tribulation. So let's look at 1 Thessalonians 4. It's one of the best, in fact, the best description of the rapture of the church. Verse 15 says this, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Asleep is just a term for those who have passed away. It's a nice, polite way. Instead of saying dead, it's like saying passed away, gone home to be with the Lord. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. It never says that Jesus steps foot on the planet here. He descends out of heaven to the clouds. With the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, it does not say trumpet, it says trump. It is probably a trumpet, but maybe it is something else. I have heard Pastors kind of comically say that maybe in the South they will hear it like y'all come home. I don't know if that's true. I don't know, but I know this. My body, if I'm alive during this time, will know it's Jesus and will respond correctly. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Those that have died before us. Those that have died after the cross of Christ, which is the start of the New Testament, and died up until this moment, they will arise first. Then we which are alive, those of us that are alive at this moment and remain, shall be caught up together in the clouds. We meet the Lord in the air. Jesus never at the rapture steps foot on the planet. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. What are we supposed to do with this information? Write long books and videos and make entire ministries based on it? No, that's not what the Apostle Paul says. The Apostle Paul says this, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. By the way, this is not a partial rapture that only certain parts of the church are going to be raptured because 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 and 52 also talks about this time and it says this, We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we 
shall be changed. This event that takes place is often have, has often had signs attributed to it. Often it said, well, these things are about to happen, then that means the rapture is going to take place. No, those signs, those signs are about the second coming, as we're going to see here in a second. There are no signs for the rapture to take place. There are no blood moons that need to take place. There are no events that need to happen for the rapture to take place. We mistakenly apply the passage of Scripture of Matthew 24 and 25, the Mount Olive Discourse. We apply that to the church and the rapture. In Matthew 24 and, verse tw and chapter 25, these events are not about the rapture. These events are post-rapture. These events are about the tribulation. It is not about the church. It is about really the focus is the nation of Israel. Matthew 24, 4 starts the tribulation. It is paralleled in Revelation chapter 6. In fact, you could almost put a line there on Matthew 24, 4, and you could write tribulation. Because after Matthew 24, 4 are all events that take place in the tribulation, not before, not about the rapture. Verse, events like verse 32, it talks about the parable of the fig tree, that generation that will not pass. That's the generation during the tribulation. Verse 36, about the days of Noah. That has nothing to do with the rapture. That has everything to do with the second coming during the tribulation. Verse 40, when it talks about two are in the field and one is taken, that is not the rapture. That is an event at the end of the tribulation at the second coming of Christ. In Matthew 25, 1, when it talks about the ten virgins, those passages of Scripture are about events that take place during the tribulation. But after the tribulation is over and after the second coming, which takes place after the tribulation, the, the rapture takes before the tribulation, the second coming takes place after the tribulation. After it is all over, Jesus gathers the remaining human beings on the planet and he divides them into two groups. On his right, he divides them into a group he will call the sheep, the good people, those that are saved. On his left, he will divide them into the goats, they are the bad. They are the unrepentance. You see, in the Bible, there are three major judgments that will take place. Number one in Revelation 20 is the great white throne. And who is judged at the great white throne? Well, everyone who has refused to accept Christ as their personal Savior. Hell is not the eternal destination for those who don't know Christ. It is a temporary holding place. Revelation 20 says that those that are in hell will be brought forward and they will stand before Jesus. And they will be judged at the great right throne. And they, if their names are not found written in the Lamb's book of life, they will be cast into their eternal destination, the lake of fire. Some will say everyone is saved and eventually everyone will go to heaven. Well, if you read the Bible in Revelation 20, those people do not go to heaven. They are cast into the lake of fire for all eternity. The second major judgment is the Bema Sea, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 9 through 10. Who is judged there? Well, it is Christians. It is not for salvation, it is not for enter into heaven, it is for rewards for what we have done. Many of us will bring rewards before Jesus and they will be judged and the wood, hay, and stubble will be thrown away and the things that we thought were so important to God, He will cast aside and put them aside and He will focus on what He truly thinks is important and we will be rewarded for what we did at that moment. But it is a third great judgment right here in Matthew 25. It is the judgment of the sheep and the goats. Who is judged? Well, I believe it's a national judgment, but it is every Gentile after the tribulation. I believe it's nation because verse 32 talks about nation. And that word means ethnic groups. Some will break that word down and mean individuals, but I think it's an ethnic groups and how they treated specifically the 144,000 witnesses or preachers or missionaries during the tribulation. During that seven-year tribulation, God will raise up 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel to preach the gospel. People will get saved in the tribulation. It will be different than our time of getting saved. It will be different than the time and the details of the Old Testament saints when they were saved. But they will come to know Christ and these witnesses will preach and they will be persecuted and they will be hunted down and they will be killed. And here in Matthew 25 verse 34, these, these nations, these people groups, these ethnic groups, these individuals will give an account for how they treated these witnesses. Look at verse 34. Then shall the king say to them on his right hand, remember these 
These are the sheep. These are the, the good ones. This is Jesus, the king, who is the ruler of this world. Come ye, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I, Jesus is saying, I, these are really the witnesses, but Jesus is saying it's himself. For I was hungered, and he gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. I cannot stress this again. This references to the 144,000 evangelist witnesses and preachers that are out in, during the time of the tribulation. But it is Jesus who is saying of himself, you have treated them. It's like you treated me. They say the same thing. It is interesting. Both of them say the same thing. The sheep and goats say the same thing. When, Lord, when did we see you? When did any of these things happen? In verse 40, he responds, And as much as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. You see, the sheep can't comprehend it because they say, We didn't see you when we were doing all of these things. When we were helping out these people in need, we didn't see you, Jesus. Where were you? Were you part of this group? And Jesus gets them their mind straight. And he says, when you did it to these least of these, these least important, these persecuted and wounded missionaries, evangelists, these preachers of the truth, when you did it to them, it was like you were doing it to me. Jesus gives the same list of examples to the goats. Uh, but the goats respond very differently. He, they ask when, and Jesus responds Jesus responds to them differently and says this in verse 45. Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these, did not do it unto one of the least of these, ye did not do it unto me. In verse 45 he says, You didn't do it to these in need? You didn't do it to these that were right in front of you? You were many of you claimed to be believers? You know, it's an amazing verse when Jesus says there will be people that said, did we not preach? Did we not cast out? Were we not pastors and teachers and everything? And Jesus will tell them, depart from me. I never knew you. Just because you go to church doesn't make you a Christian. Just because you have the title of a minister does not make you a minister. And what does he say to them? And these shall go away into temporary? No, no. Into everlasting punishment. But the righteous the goats, and to life eternal. If you know Christ as your personal Savior, you have eternal life. It's one of the reasons why I, can't, I believe I can never lose my salvation because Jesus will not take that eternal life away. There is going to be never a time in my existence, in my conscious soul existence, that I will never know the presence of Jesus. Right now I know His presence but in, in spirit, but one day when I leave this planet, I will know him personally face to face because absent from the body for the believer is present with the Lord. The sheep, well, the sheep go into what we like to call the millennial kingdom of God, a thousand year reign. You see, the kingdom of God today is a spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of God is not physical, it is spiritual. Satan is sort of the ruler of this world system. But Jesus will come back after the end of the tribulation and set up his real earthly kingdom. A thousand year reign and the kingdom of God will be physical. You see, the difference between the sheep and the goats is what they did and didn't do. But deeper than that, it's not just what they did and didn't do. It's why. It's why they did what they did and why they refused to do anything. You see, the sheep were born again. They knew Jesus and they were pushed to treat people differently. They, they weren't even expecting a reward in this passage, does it? They didn't do it because they thought somebody would pat them on the back or even notice. They were treated people differently. They treated people like Jesus because they were saved. They were born again. They were a new creature. And it compelled them. But the goats, you see, the goats were religious. The goats are bored when God's word is preached. You know, the huge difference between religious people and people with a relationship in Jesus is this. Relationship is more concerned with people than rules. And religion is more concerned with rituals than people. You see, religion is all concerned about procedures in a church. 
how we do this, when we have to do this, and who does this. But a relationship, a relationship is concerned about people getting saved. You know, I've been in the ministry for over 30 years, and I have yet to have a, a meeting at a church about the overwhelming concern that people were having, that not, pe- that not enough people or anyone was coming to know Christ as their personal Savior. I have had people stop me and pull me aside and complain about the air freshener in the ladies' bathroom. I have had people stop and pull me aside about the, the, the children misbehaving in church. But I have never yet had anyone in over 30 years of preaching the gospel pull me aside and say, Pastor, I want to talk to you about the overwhelming concern I have that there has not been anyone except Christ as their personal Savior in a month in our church. Something has to be done about that. But I have had meetings about some of the silly, most ridiculous things. You see, religion and religious people are concerned about rituals and procedures. But people who have a relationship with Jesus, they're just concerned about people. So here's a question for you. How does God motivate you? What does God have to do to motivate you to serve Him? Let's just reread Jesus' final words to the goats. And we're going to read these a few times. Then shall He answer... He answered them and saying, Verily I say unto you, As much as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did not it to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. If that doesn't motivate you, I don't know what will. There's sort of two parts of motivation there. One, there's the motivation of Jesus being disappointed in you. I know as a, as, a, as a child, one of the worst things that could happen to me when I got in trouble is to hear those words from my father. I'm just disappointed in you. You'd almost rather be spanked or punished or grounded. But there's also the motivation that Jesus is saying, they shall go away into everlasting punishment. Listen, you will not go to heaven because you do good things. You are not going to heaven because you set up an orphanage or anything else. But you know, one of the ways you know you're a believer and on your way to heaven is that you cannot help but do things for other people and minister to other people. If it has never bothered you that there are people dying and going to hell, that there are children being abused by this world system, that there are are homeless people who are hungry, if it never breaks your heart for them, then you should be motivated by the fact that you may not know Christ as your personal Savior. You see, I will never be on the side of the goats. I will never go through the tribulation. But the least of these... The least of these are not just confined to the tribulation. There are least of these today because there are still homeless. There are still hungry, imprisoned, sick. There are still thirsty. There are still malnourished people. Let's just reread those verses again to the goats. And he answered them saying, Verily I say unto you, as much as ye did it not, one of the least of these, he did it not to me, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. You see the truth? If God is mad about these religious people in this time period for not doing anything and not acting, why do you think he's okay with you? If God is upset that these religious people turned their back and did nothing about all the suffering and the issues of that time period, why do you think God is going to give you a free pass today? I experience God. I experience God by serving God. I get blessed by God. I get blessed by God when I bless other people. And I need some mental health encouragement today. And when I need that, There's no better joy I ever have than helping a least of these. I won't lose my salvation, but I am going to miss out an amazing experience, God's blessing, and I'm going to miss out on finally knowing joy by not serving Jesus. That is one of the reasons why Cross Creek Church started the Cross Creek Foundation, helping little third graders, helping them with reading and a whole bunch of other things. It all started with a simple prayer. One of the elders and I praying, Andy getting together and praying and just basically saying, Lord, give us an answer. Help us to see someone in need. And then you could call it coincidence if you want. I don't believe in coincidence. I don't believe in fate. I believe in Jesus. Things just fell into place and I found myself 
talking to a teacher, talking to a principal, asking what we could do and what they wanted us to do lined up with what we wanted to do. That's just helping someone. So can I reread a little passage to you in verse 35? I was hungry and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And can I just, if you will allow me to add to the word of God, I was a little kid and you helped me learn to read. God is expecting you. God is demanding you as a believer to act in this crazy world. The world needs us to act. And I want to give you three things as we close today. The world needs us to act, number one, even when we are hurt. The world needs us to act even when we are hurt. I saw this meme on social media a few weeks back, and I thought it was pretty good. And it says this, one of the hardest pills I've ever had to swallow was realizing I meant nothing to people that meant everything to me. You know, it's easy to get self-absorbed, especially when we are hurt. It is easy when we, are, we have been betrayed and we feel unlovable to just focus on ourselves. But let's both pull back and look at Jesus as an example. From the garden to the, his cross experience, he experienced pain. He experienced a tragedy and suffering that we could never imagine. But the Bible says he never lashed out. He even ministers on the cross to his mom and to the other thief and leads him into salvation. He even expressed compassion while he's walking with his cross to, to, the, to the hill to other people. May I say as a personal experience, I have needed Cross Creek Church these last few years that we've started. I have needed Cross Creek more than Cross Creek needed me. And I need to help those kids more. I need the help more than they need the help from me. Heck, I can barely even read myself. But it's been said that hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. And, and I think that's true. But you know what? Hurt Christians help people. You will never go through this world without being hurt. And it can't stop you from helping and serving Jesus. But it can be the thing that drives you to help someone else to never experience what you've gone through. Secondly, the world needs us to act. Number two, even when we are not the best. Even when we are not the best. Maybe you're thinking when your pastor gets up and asks for volunteers or when you've been confronted and asked to do something or you see something and a need right in front of you and maybe you are thinking, I would love to help, but I'm not good at it and then insert that subject. You see, you don't need to be perfect to act. You just need to act. I have some amazing friends. Uh, I have one friend whose life goal is to to keep me in my place and to never let me get too big of a head. I, I say nagging me. Uh, she says grounding me. Either way, we can debate over the term. But I also have these two friends who are amazing musicians. I grew up with them in church as kids, and they're some of my best friends. And one is this amazing piano player who has a degree in it. Another is an amazing guitar player and a musician who has put out records, who is on uh, iTunes and everything like that. And I, I watch them play, and I have tried to play the piano and tried to learn to play the guitar, and, and I am just so jealous at them. I, I, I would love to be an expert in music. I have no ability at it at all. I, I would Honestly, I would love to be an expert at something because truthfully, I am pretty mediocre at just about everything I do. But God doesn't want me to be good. That is a relief. God doesn't want me to be good. He just wants me to show up. 1 Corinthians 1.27 says this, but God had chosen the foolish things of the world. Thank you very much, Lord. I think that you were talking about me. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. You are not the best. Well, I've got good news for you. You're the one God wants to use. Because if God used the super the talented and the wonderful, well, who gets the praise and glory when the job gets done? They do. 
But when God uses the screw-ups and the mess-ups who have no ability or talents, and God is able to do something through them, who gets the praise and the glory then? Someone looks at that and says, that is unbelievable. That is a miracle that person was able to do it. That must be an act of God. If you are not the best, that's okay. God uses the foolishness of this world. And number three, the world needs us to act because they need Jesus. Because they need Jesus. You know, the NFL has a month where they call cancer awareness. And all the, the players wear pink. In baseball, different, different times, they have games. And during the game, people will hold up signs of names of people they love who have passed away or been afflicted by cancer. All under the banner of cancer awareness, of awareness, letting people know about it. And I hope you understand what I'm about to say. I, I really do, but I don't think we need more awareness. Is there anyone who does not know about cancer? Is there anyone in this country or even in this world who does not hate cancer? Who doesn't know that cancer is horrible? I don't think we need more awareness about cancer. I think we need a cure for it. You see, the, the world knows it's horrible. The world, when it comes out of its drunken super, it knows it's going down. It knows things are getting worse when they have clear conscience and thought. They don't need to be aware that they're a sinner. They need to know Jesus is the cure for their sin. We don't need to study the Word of God anymore. We need to do something with what we know. We don't need to advertise Jesus to the world. They need to finally know Christ and experience grace and forgiveness that only the cross can do. Let your life story be that, yes, my life on this planet was short. So instead of doing horrible things or indulging myself and trying to experience the most sin I could, instead of living my short life for myself, I pointed people to Jesus. I started to act because the world needs Jesus. You know, I think some of the old hymns are really some of the best songs in Christianity. And one of my all-time favorite hymns is Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. And my favorite line from that hymn is this, this is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This last week I found myself kind of stuck in a mini traffic jam. And this song on iTunes just happened to come up. And I heard it and I just sitting there in traffic realized how amazing Jesus is. And that I want my story and I want the song of my life to bring praise to Jesus. This song was written by Fanny Crosby, a blind little old lady. What could a blind little lady, old lady do, she thought? Well, she could write an amazing song. She did what God wanted her to do. She took her tragedy and she blessed other people with it. She experienced the forgiveness that only the cross of Jesus Christ can give. And even though she was blind and had difficulties, she had a life of joy. What's keeping you from making Jesus your story? It's time to act. Doesn't matter what you're able to do or who you are. If you know Christ as your personal savior, it's time to act. For I was hungry and you gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in, naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. The world that we live in is crazy and chaotic and horrible. It needs Jesus, and Jesus needs you to start acting and do something. God bless you. Thank you for joining us online. Have a great day.